RAF, Biggin Hill, 18th August, 1940, the hardest day. There are many who do not know about the hardest day, a significant Second World War air battle between the German Luftwaffe and the British Royal Air Force on August 18th, 1940, during the Battle of Britain. What happened on the hardest day? What unfolded between the countries which led to this battle? Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel where we bring you unique news for your amusement. And in this video, we will reveal all the details about an incident that will go down in history as a watershed moment. On that day, the Luftwaffe launched an all-out assault on RAF Fighter Command. What happened after resulted in something so catastrophic that the battle itself was named the hardest day. What really happened on August 18, 1940? Stay tuned to find out. Since August 13, the Luftwaffe has started targeting Fighter Command airfields, although so far they've just caused nuisance rather than harm. The German strategy to eliminate the Royal Air Force, both on the ground and in the air, was not working. Looking back on some of the previous day's attacks, it was confirmed that many of them had been of significant magnitude. But Fighter Command had always managed to hold their own. If only just. Convoys in the channel seemed to be the thing of the past. Goring had given up on destroying radar sites, and the aim was to target RAF airfields. However, they were not creating a significant setback to Fighter Command at the time. Many of the airfields attacked by the Luftwaffe belonging to the Coastal Command, the Fleet Air Arm, or RAF training facilities. Furthermore, as shown in recent days, the Luftwaffe raids were not focused in any one location. They were dispersed. An early attack could be on the East Coast, followed by an attack off the Kent Coast, and then they switched to the West. With attacks like this, the RAF was able to hold their own. Thanks to the formation of Fighter Command, the planned mass onslaught had not transpired, that is, as off. The Luftwaffe was well aware that some of the more significant airfields around London, most notably Hornchurch, Biggin Hill and Kenley, were critical fighter command bases. They had no idea they were sector stations, merely significant airfields in the fighter command hierarchy. A look into the history of the hardest day. The goal was to entirely demolish Kenley and Biggin Hill on August 18, 1940, with a well-planned attack and replicate the same at Hornchurch and other critical airfields to fighter command. This was the strategy for the day, and it was here that most of the combat took place during the day. In the afternoon, there was little activity around the Isle of Wight towards the south. The late afternoon saw primarily east coast activity, which kept many squadron occupied and a few skirmishes in the west. The primary attraction though was Kenley and Biggin Hill. Both target airfields also housed the vital sector operations center, from which British aircraft was guided into action. These airfields were chosen for attack only because they were believed to be among the most prominent operating fighters. However, the German intelligence service was unaware of the sector operations rooms. However, if these inadequately protected structures were to be attacked, killing or injuring individuals within, it would be a body blow to the fighter control system in these sectors. If the Germans were to breach Britain's fighter defenses to launch an invasion of England, they would have to do so quickly. Goring convened his generals for conference after conference after the meeting. They talked about strategies, failures, missions, radar, and even the weather. They too were becoming dissatisfied as it had been projected in mid-July that it would take roughly six days to knock the RAF out of the skies. The six-day period had now stretched into four weeks, and the Luftwaffe was not closer to triumph than it had ever been a few weeks before. In fact, they were losing ground to fighter command. Although many casualties on both sides were overstated, it was a reality that the Luftwaffe lost two for every RAF plane shot down. When this was put together with the fact that British fighter production significantly outpaced that of Germany, the RAF was well ahead at this point. However, Germany's air force was not yet depleted. The Luftwaffe could call on 1,240 bombers and 745 BF-109s for a total of little under 2,000 aircraft. To counter any attacks by these planes, the RAF had only 825 fighters, including 520 Hurricanes and 258 Spitfires, Defiance, Blenheims, and Gladiators were among the 47 other aircraft that were rarely employed in combat but could be called upon if needed. Of these, 11 groups possessed 80 Spitfires, 245 Hurricanes, and 15 Blenheims spread across 23 squadrons. Crews of the DO-17s 
As soon as the Dorniers passed the southern border of Kenley, the parachute and cable PAC that had been deployed at 60-foot intervals on the northern perimeter were blasted into the air by rocket. When the 500-foot rope reached its limit, a parachute would open, suspending the steel cable in the air and allowing it to descend slowly. If an aircraft collided with the cable, a second parachute would automatically release at the wire's base, making it difficult for the enemy aircraft to fly since one wing would be pushed back by the entangle line and the two parachutes. Because of the bomber's low altitude and speed, the machine gunners and anti-aircraft batteries on the airstrip had difficulty pinpointing their targets. According to one gunner, it was difficult to follow the raider's movement. So they pointed the barrel of the gun in front of those bombers and fired expecting that the bombers would run into the gunfire. The Dorniers dropped their cargo of 20 110-pound bombs one by one, and the defenses were powerless to stop them. The noise, smoke, fire, and explosions were deafening. They blazed a path of total destruction one by one. The precise bombing caused damage to hangars, domestic blocks, administration buildings, and officers' mess, and the station headquarters structure. Bombs dropped from the formation, bombers bounced along the runway like ping-pong balls on a table tennis table before exploding. But if the bombardment was successful, it came at a cost. One DO-17 was hit as they approached. However, it is unclear whether it was shot by gunfire from one of the 111 Squadron Hurricanes or by Kenley ground fire. But the bomber continued to stream smoke and drop its lethal cargo of bombs before crashing. Feldwebel Wilhelm Rab had just released his bomb load when a PAC was sent into the sky. But the Dornier was in the middle of the banking spin, so the cable almost missed his plane. PACs did, however, account for two more Dorniers, which were thrown off balance when the wires caught their wings. 111 and 615 squadrons struck other Dorniers as they rose to gain altitude. The Aftermath By the time the Dorniers were in position at 100 feet to launch their low-altitude attack, 610 squadron had been met by 32 squadron Biggin Hill. Hurricanes, and the two of them were wreaking havoc on the Luftwaffe. Well-planned attack. As at Kenley, the ground crew launched the PAC rockets as the DO-17s approached, resulting in the destruction of two of them. Other planes were forced to conduct evasive maneuvers. As a result, many of the bombs were released prematurely and landed in the open positions of the landing field or amid the trees in the forested area to the east of the airfield. Some bombs and shrapnel landed near the station building but did not do significant damage. Joan Mortimer was a member of the operations team. The attack on Biggin Hill was supposed to be a carbon repeat of the previous raid on Kenley. The initial attack was carried out by nine low-flying Dorniers, followed by high-level bombing raids by Heinkel and JU-88 bombers. The difference here was that seven of the nine Dorniers that participated in the low-level strike were never to return to their bases. As with the Kenley strike, the timing of the attacks was off. The Dorniers came far earlier than expected, whereas the Heinkels arrived much later. While the attacks on Kenley and Biggin Hill fighter stations will always be remembered, nothing is known about the German air raids on the Coastal Command Airport as Thorny Island, as well as the fleet air arm aerodromes of Gosport and Ford. Historians and experts have long wondered why fleet air arm air bases were attacked despite the fact that they were not a part of the Royal Air Force Fighter Command. Maybe the German authorities thought the FAA bases represented a threat, but the most logical and widely accepted explanation was Germany's inadequate intelligence service. And this brings us to the end of the video. If you want it illuminating, then do like and share with those who are deep into history as you are. If you haven't subscribed already, then do it right now and stay connected with us. What are your thoughts on today's video? Have you heard of this event before? Let us know in the comments section below. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.